players are at nine and two. So hoping, hoping to make it. I think if, what I've heard from most of the players saying right now is that if you can go to 12 and two, they're expecting that should be an easy shot to draw in. Yeah, that uh, would be my expectation as well. So wins here, really what both players are wanting. And we go ahead and start Eric Bloom with Copperline Gorge. Kind of, I think a telltale thing. I imagine this is the only deck, one of the only decks in modern that plays this land. I, I think that if you ran into a Jund list, you might see one or two of these hanging out. But yes, you it could, is. could, yeah. It, 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 this is one of those things where if you're really in tune with the format, you have a very good idea what's going on. Uh, but if you're not on top of things, it doesn't give away that much information. Yeah. And with only 64 players in day two, the idea of keeping your deck choice a secret really becomes tougher for the players. A lot of them start to know what the other contenders are on. Turn one Glistener Elf from Andrew Jessup. And if Andrew didn't know then, he knows now. Eric Cycles, Deadshot, Minotaur on Insta. That is the giveaway. And Street Wraith. So Eric down to 18. That's not going to be a problem at all. He's playing against Infect. There are no flyers that Deadshot Minotaur really gets to shoot down. Just, just a pair of three fours here. Sometimes he gets to kill something. Like I said, this is <laughs> this is not going to be the most attractive creature base. You're not going to see superstars. There's no Tom Glaives hanging out here, but uh, you just got to find anything with Cycle on it and slap it in the deck, and that means you have to play with some dubious cards. Yeah, and you see the awkward spot that puts Jessup in his hand, having a lot of weapons, like two copy, copies of Apostle's Blessing already in his hand. These just don't seem like they match up very well. No, they do very little. In, in most matchups, they're very powerful at, at fizzling removal spells, but Eric is going so far over the top that uh, it's unlikely to be very effective. Yeah. Now, there are some things they can do. So the two cards that Eric uses to Cascade in the Living End are Demonic Dread and a Violent Outburst. Now, Demonic Dread is a three-minute sorcery that requires a creature to be used. So Andrew has some outs. He can maybe, If he only gets to attack with Ink Moth Nexus, he can turn off Demonic Dreads. He's already played a Glistener Elf, though, so that's not really going to be an option this game. Well, that's why you see one copy of Dryad Arbor floating around in these lists, is to make sure they can fetch for a target. Yeah. And he does have the one there, just, just so you can make sure that that happens. And we'll get to see a Jataxian Pro from Jessup. So we see a lot of, a lot of creatures. So Monstrous Carabid, <laughs> Godless Shrine. He does have a Demonic Dread and a Violent Outburst, so able to Living End twice. There's a fifth card in there as well. Uh, with the Carabid, that should be enough creatures in the yard that this is an attractive option for Eric. Yeah, the, the, the only sketchy thing is the Nexus hanging out in play. Uh, in a perfect world, Eric would find a Fulminator Mage first to clear that off of the table. Exactly. But this is still a pretty good position to go off from. Well, what's nice is Violent Outburst is an instant, so if he can take a lot of hits off this Glistener Elf and then decide if at any point Andrew decides to burn some pump spells, well, then he'll just cast a Living End. Yeah. I think one of my favorite parts about watching Living End play, though, is the surprising number of games where they just start casting things like Deadshot Minotaur. Like, they make five lands and make a 3-4. Not plan A, but I no, have seen it as it well. It happens way more frequently, I think, than, than players would like to admit. Well, often the other deck kind of gets in this holding pattern of, I don't want to play more stuff, just right. going to play my one thing. And once you get to five mana, like, yeah, yeah these creatures are pretty ugly, but whatever, they're still roughly Tarmic Wipe size. You can play them, induce your opponent to keep adding to the board, and then Living End gets back your army of nitwits in the graveyard. Let's be real. If you need to, you can pitch Simeon Spirit Guide to play a turn 4-3-4. Four, four. Yeah, that is quite the deal. Normally when I watch this deck in action, it's in the process of hard casting a Simeon Spirit Guide. That's true. 2-2 two is not to be underestimated. And you see Andrew kind of in that holding pattern. He swings with Glistener Elf on his turn, pumps it with Pendlehaven, deal two points of poison damage, but does not commit anything more on his turn. Being very conservative with his resources. You see things like Apostles Blessing, two of them, a Distortion Strike in Andrew's hand. He's got a lot of tools for pushing through blockers. He does have a Mutagenic Growth and a Become Immense as well, so he could go for the Lethal Pump at any point. Yeah, he's but. just trying to pace it in such a way where he, you know, induces a living end here without dying on the way back and with leaving himself some resources left over. That is the worry, right? If Eric gets 15 toughness power worth of creatures in the graveyard, then that violent outburst is not just a sweeper for Andrew's creatures, but it also creates a lethal board for Eric. Correct. And that to me seems like what Eric's gonna wanna build up toward. The other danger is that if Eric gets up to six mana, 
Eric can go ahead and use Demonic Dread on his turn and leave up a Violent Outburst as a second sweeper. Yeah, and having access to it at instant speed is, makes things incredibly complicated for Andrew. Another nice thing about Living End, you want to build a foil version of the deck, not that expensive. No, nope, not. There's actually a lot of, uh, the, all the foil shots cards are actually because of, there's a lot more of them floating around. Yeah. Not to mention they're mon cards like Monsters Care a bit, so <laughs> they're not that hard to find. Right. You gotta go digging through the dumpster maybe, but they're there. Noble Hierarch play from Andrew, just putting a little more pressure down. Yep, and Noble Hierarch is one of those non-essential elements where it helps add to the clock, but it's not a critical resource for Andrew to rebuild with. Swing pumps with Pendlehaven, and it looks like that was enough pressure to get the Violent Outburst from Eric. So now we can see the deck in action. Here's Violent Outburst. Attacking creatures get plus O plus one, so we actually actually let Andrew attack before casting it. So actually never happened. Well, the Living End is going to happen first here. You see All Stars like main deck Leyline of Sanctity. Yeah, there's always so many cycling creatures, so you can fill out the deck with some flex slots. You can have some real garbage in the deck, and it's okay if you want. And by garbage, I mean, I mean, you know, uncast conditional things, uncastable cards. Typically, the deck, for the record, plays three copies of Living End. This is actually something you do have to be aware of in playing the deck. When you draw a copy of Living End, you have to know just how many sweepers are actually left in your deck. Right. And you, you definitely do not want to draw this card. Uh, no, nope, I've occasionally seen it get suspended, but it, 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 see, it feels like it's often a losing play. I mean, there's not much else you can do with it. So sometimes you're just like, well, might as well suspend one. So Living End resolves. The Noble Hierarch and the Glistener Elf are put into the graveyard for Andrew. Deadshot Minotaur, Street Wraith, and Monstrous Carabid are in play for Eric. That is 10 power worth of creatures, so it's a two-turn clock. Because we know Andrew actually does have a lethal swing next turn with Income Off Nexus that he can go for. Yep. Dryad Arbor in play for Eric. Swings for 10. And with those Apostles Blessings, this might be a game going for Andrew. Yeah, he might be able to see this one through. Definitely, I think, would be a steal for him to get this game. But yeah, with the protection of these Apostles Blessings, and now picking up another copy of Mutagenic Growth, it, it looks like Andrew has what it takes here. He doesn't have another land, so he can activate. He can, I think he'll have to become a here, so he doesn't get to have the protection of cards like Apostle's Blessing. Here we go, Ink Moth Nexus going to get activated. 1-1, one, one. in fact, he has to do seven more this turn, but that's, that certainly is possible. It's gonna go ahead and swing. And here's a first card, it's Mutagenic Growth. That'll put Andrew three, we'll put, make the Nexus a three, three, and Become Immense should be enough to make it lethal. And this is the other card living in against the main deck. Beast Within is your other card. Yep. Two copies in Eric's main deck here. Very flexible removal spell for this kind of strategy. Yeah, now Andrew, had Andrew drawn a land this turn, he would be in the clear. He'd be able to Apostle's Blessing this guy and then be able to give it pro green. He'd have to then in response, I suppose maybe they may not have enough cards until like in response but come amends. Yeah, he needs to be, he basically needs to use all of his green pump spells first and then Apostle's Blessing to fizzle the beast with it. Right. Yep, and that's and too much to overcome. It. Yeah, actually, even with the land, I think he's a little short, because he mutagenic growth, goes to three, then Eric Beast Withins, and you'd have to get another card in the graveyard and then Apostle's Blessing, but that's, he can't pay four life to do all this, so... Yeah, I, looked like he was a little short in a variety a of different short, ways. Yeah, he's and close, though. Eric was able to hold on, though. Game one over to Eric Bloom and Living End, understandably here. 
these players get ready for game two. We're going to go ahead and go back to our schedule. We've been talking about the other events we have coming up this year. Talked about how season two ends in our first ever Modern Invitational. It is not the only one in a Modern Invitational. If you're over on the West Coast, can't really make it for that kind of season end event. Well, season four will also be ending with a Modern Invitational as we will show the schedule for that. We start out over out east with the opens in Cincinnati and Worcester. Those are modern and standard. Then we start making a trip west through Milwaukee, Indianapolis, making it to the Midwest before we head south to Atlanta, St. Louis, and Dallas. See Legacy in St. Louis, Modern in Dallas, Standard Open back in Philadelphia, and then we end our series out on the West Coast as we make our way there. Atlanta, New Jersey, and then Standard in Denver and a Standard Modern Invitational to end the season in Seattle. After that, we're going to be at for the Players' Championship at the end of the year, Roanoke, Virginia, December 19th and 20th. And we're to qualify for the Players' Championship a bunch of different ways to do that. You can do that through our invitationals. By winning an invitational, you can be a points leader also for any individual season or at the end of the year. And it looks like we're getting closer and closer to locking up our second player for the Players' Championship, our defending champion, Brad Nelson. He's already qualified. And Jim Davis you know, looks like he is very close to locking up the point invite for the Players' Championship via season one. Yeah, one, two more events still on the books. Eric Smith wasn't, or Kevin Jones rather, was not able to make good inroads on it this his Jim's lead this weekend Jim's actually going to extend farther into the lead yeah so looking at the sideboard here Andrew with four copies of nature's claim a dispel two spell spear pierces two spell skites a wild defiance two copies of dismember a dryad arbor a twisted image and a distortion strike there's so little to use here I mean counter spells though to be fair they are great against living end he's got two copies of spell pierce so you have to think he's going to use them both Yes, they, they seem like they're they're pretty good at fighting living and they can also counter beast within pretty effectively. I think those have to come in. Yeah, because that you, I think you may also see Spell Skite just because beast within is a card, but really outside of those Spell Pierces and Spell Skites, I'm not sure there are maybe the Dispel for a beast within. There aren't actually too many cards in living end that Andrew can interact with. Right, I don't mind the Distortion Strike here because sometimes living end will generate a big board. Andrew can have one creature to follow up with and can use that to get through the locked up board and go for a kill. But it's very narrow. The spell pierces seem like the best thing going on here. All right, over on Eric's side, one thing about Living End is they don't have a lot of sideboard options. The restriction of you can't play anything that costs one or two in the deck does does limit things. Yeah, we're looking at three copies of Ink and Chewer, two Nod of the Bones, two Shriek Moss, a Rest in Peace, a Kataki, a Stony Silence, two copies of Ricochet Trap, three copies of Slaughter Games. Uh, I like the Shriek Maws, and that's yeah. about it. So Shriek Maw, pretty interesting. It's a five mana card that you can evoke for two. So it's, you see these evoke creatures, Ingot or Shriek Maw in the sideboard. They're kind of ways to cheat that requirement of no cards that cost one or two. Yeah, just a, a generic kill spell seems decent here, but especially better than something like Leyline of Sanctity, which is in his main deck and does nothing. Yeah, pretty easy to cut that card. Not a lot going on there. It forces Andrew to Jataxian Probe himself. That, that is it. That's the only interaction yeah, it has. I, I think that's worth cutting. All right. And Shrink Maw is a real card. Yeah. Like, two mana sorcery speed, Terror is solid in this matchup, and Shriek Maw is a little bit better than that because of the implications with Living End. Yeah, absolutely. When it comes back, it gets to kill something again. Sometimes Shriek Maw actually has to, it's interesting, it, when it comes back, it has to kill Eric's own creatures. It's not actually a May trigger. But right, but when, it, he's, getting fine, the, when yeah. he's getting into those kind of spots, he's probably really advantaged to the games. I don't completely agree. You can spare the Jungle Weaver or whatever. <laughs> Doug Reaver, the dead shot Minotaur, the, the Simeon Spirit Guide. <laughs> this is a this is a motley crew of creatures. I mean, this is a real All rogue. All sorts of just animals here. A real rogues gallery. Some apes, some beasts, spiders, spiders, minotaurs. Uh, in Caribbean's an insect, right? Yeah, it's like it's a really it's a monstrous insect. Right. It's a really big insect. Uh, we have actually some humans, architects of will. Mm -hmm. Um, is Fulminator Mage a human? I'm, I think he's an elemental. Okay, right, yeah, right, 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 yep, right, yeah. yep, elemental. His head's on fire, so he's probably an elemental. Um, street Wraith, that's some sort of undead wraith. Zombie, zombie or wraith, yeah, or, I'm guessing. A zombie. Don't know for sure. Some zombie tribal implications there. Potentially, probably yeah. just a wraith. Anyhow, it's a motley crew. Right, it's... <laughs> All right, we're underway here for game two. Andrew Jessup, he's down a game, he's on the play. See him over here, number 15 on our leaderboard. 
Hoping to make his first Players' Championship this year was not in it last season, but really making a bid for it with a strong end to last season and really keeping it up. It was actually his, his brother, Danny, who came extremely close to snagging an invite, losing in the finals of the season four Invitational to Dylan Donegan. But Andrew Jessup has been climbing up the leaderboard. In our top 16 right now, you see in 15th place, two buys for the Open Series. So turn one for Andrew. It's going to be a breeding pool into one of his one drops. Glistener Elf or Noble Hierarch. Looks like it's going to be Glistener Elf. And he'll pass. One way Andrew can interact is if he just has one of his lightning fast draws. He can get sneak by that way. Yep. Let's see, become immense. Pendle Haven. A might of old Krosa. An extremely fast draw or a reasonably fast draw backed up by Spell Pierce are kind of the recipes that Andrew's looking for. And he certainly doesn't want to go to the long game in this matchup. Sometimes Infect does a good job of playing this tempo game where you get one creature, you pressure and disrupt, and that's maybe not where he wants to be in this one. Let's we'll see what he goes for. Crack of a fetch land here. Maybe he'll just might have old Krosa immediately and then become immense on the following turn. He does have a... If Eric has nothing, Andrew can turn three kill him. He just green lights every pump spell. And there's not much of a reason not to just be pushing as hard as possible. Because Eric's deck is not filled with that much interaction for this kind of opening. Also, the longer the game goes, the worse it is for Andrew. So uh, I think he's best served throwing caution to the wind and trying to set up a turn three kill if his hand enables it. Yeah, I believe it does. Might have old Krosa here because it's on his own turn. Should be plus four, plus four. Here comes five poison off the Glistener Elf. This is, you know, Blue Green Effect capable of turn three kills. I think one of the reasons that's pretty acceptable in modern is that it's pretty disruptible. Yes. And that's, I, I think that honestly, R&D got themselves into a little bit of trouble by declaring the format as a turn four format because the bigger priority is, does the format feel right? Not this right. kind of how, arbitrary benchmark. What bar, it, maybe I can combo you on turn three, but what do you have to do to stop me? You know, exactly. And how consistent is it? Right, like, like it's okay that Storm can turn three because it's turn three's all involved me having this grizzly bear that I play that you just can't do anything about. Yeah. We do see here, this one things, Eric gonna go ahead and stop that kill. He has a turn two living end. Is off the, with the help of Simeon Spirit Guide, he'll cast Demonic Dread and he'll get to sweep up the board. Yeah. That puts a stop to the turn three kill Andrew was setting up for. And, and this is the reason that you see Simeon Spirit Guide in this kind of deck, even though there just aren't that many spells to cast. The ability to break serve in matchups like this is a, a huge asset for this deck. So both Glissner Elves hit the yard, and for Eric, just one creature, he gets a monstrous Carabid. Now, 4-4 four, four is pretty good, but as these creatures are, you know, kind of motley here, Carabid's going to have to attack every turn, which means he doesn't actually get to leave back a blocker for the Infect cards. Yep. And Andrew very quickly is able to reassemble here with a Nexus off the top. And that presents lethal as early as next turn. Grand Eric does have answers. That's like Beast Within in, in his deck. Fulminator Mage as well. Ink Moth to play. We'll go back to Eric, see if he has any of those answers to Ink Moth. There's a no decisions here. Carabit is going to be coming in. My favorite types of cards are the save you a click on Magic Online designs. The Carabit definitely qualifies. You're all a Valley Dasher play. Valley Dasher, Tatter Munch Maniac. Dalphy Slayer. They, they only know one language. That's attacking. Yep. Andrew goes on to 12 with the hit, with the hit off the 4-4. Four, four. Also helpful against Mind Slaver Lock. It's the thing that can come <laughs> up. No plays for Eric. And we'll go back over to Andrew. Does he want to go all in on this Ink Moth Nexus? He could wait for an Apostle's Blessing or a Vines of Vastwood to protect himself. But, but he also knows that Eric's getting draw steps to relevant cards as well and the ability to potentially living in again at instant speed. There's a lot of things he just can't play around. Yeah. I'm gonna go ahead and activate the Ink Moth Nexus. We'll see if he goes for the Pump Spell or just for the Pendle Haven. It's gonna swing. And it looks like Become Immense is gonna try for the win. Delving five, is it gonna be enough damage to win? Goes for it, and right. it is. On to game three. Story checks out. Become Immense really has given an extra dimension to this deck. That's a uh, it's just a yeah. lot of damage. I, and that's where you get the analog to Legacy, where you think, see things like Invigorate Berserk combo people out for very little mana. But Come Immense 
is something close to that all rolled into one card. Uh, there are issues of diminishing returns. You know, your second copy of Become a Man is pretty hard to cast, but the first one is so good that you see these decks play four, even though the second and third copies are often not doing very much for you. Right, so one of a lot of times in Legacy, in fact, but here you, you play the full, the full four is worth it. You don't have that um, invigorate right. style card. So yeah, disruption, uh, as we were talking before, disruption and how consistent it is, should factor into whether or not certain turn, potentially turn three or even faster decks are acceptable in the format. Uh, you know, Gorio's Vengeance Grizzlebrand can kill pretty quickly. Its best draws kill very, very fast, but Absolutely. the deck's very inconsistent, has not showed up very much in tournament play, is pretty easy to disrupt if it ever became a part of the format. And so even though it has the potential to kill very fast, really no one cares at, at the end of the day. Uh, whereas the decks that kill very quickly and are powerful, consistent, hard to disrupt, those ones get hit by bans. So, you know, I, I think that potentially the Amulet deck is one of the decks on the radar to potentially receive a, a ban because it does kill potentially very fast. It's a powerful deck and it's yeah. hard to interact with its best draws. But it's not really, it's actually, it's putting up results, but its popularity is still pretty low. You know, see one copy right. making day two here. So, um, it really, I, it depends on, you know, how, how bad does it get for the format, right? If no right. one's playing it, it's maybe still okay. So I think a lot of players, when they see decks that kill on turn three sometimes, say, ban something, ban something, ban something, because of R&D's initial declaration. But uh, I think there's some wiggle room inside of that. And, and R&D does seem to agree. Uh, not every deck that potentially kills on turn three or sooner gets immediately banned. Uh, so it's more about, does the format feel right, rather than are we abiding by these parameters we set out early on? Interesting to see. I mean, there certainly has been a lot of... There's also something said, I think, with the amount of changes that are made in the last ban list to really let things, let things sit for a while. Yep. Getting on to game three here. So guys get ready for game three. One thing that we also have here uh, is the book Next Level Deck Building, something that came out on Star City Games by Patrick Chapin, the innovator. It is, it's been around, it's the first time in paperback you can own your physical copy, not just as an ebook. It's coming soon on StarCityGames.com. Yeah, from Pro Tour champion, Magic Hall of Famer, and two time worlds runner up, Patrick Chapin, uh, the most prolific magic writer, uh, someone who's contributed so much to the philosophies of playing and deck building. Very excited to finally bring this product out on paperback. Very well received on it in its ebook form and uh, a valuable addition to any magic player's library. Let's get ready here for game three. We have Eric Bloom. He's back on the play with Living End. So Andrew able to have one of his very fast draws. Was able to actually get game two here. And we're underway. Eric's going to start by cycling a Street Wraith. With cards like that in the deck, sometimes I remember having played Living End just a couple times. The mulliganing decisions with the deck actually can be very interesting. You have so much cycling that sometimes you, it's really unclear what kind of hand you've just kept. Right, your opening hand is really like seven wild cards yeah, or six yeah. wild cards in a land, so it's hard to know. It's like you'll get one land, you'll get, you know, a land, a cascade spell, two street wraiths, and one monstrous carabid, and you'll say, okay, well, can I? It's, it's hard to mulligan uh, yeah. because the cards, they could be anything. We see. It's whatever your heart <laughs> desires, that's what they become. We see here he has lands number two and three, Copperline Gorge and Forest. He has two of the Cascade spells, Demonic Dread and Violent Outburst. And then he has Fulminator Mage and Architects of Will. This has got to be a pretty strong keep for Living End. Yeah, really solid, able to disrupt Andrew multiple times. And Fulminator Mage, a really strong card in these matchups. He Generally, you want to play it before the Living End so that it can be sacrificed, killing a land, and then you get brought back to kill another one. And we've seen that Eric's deck does struggle a little bit with Ink Moth Nexus. It's, it's a harder card for him to interact with. So a Beast Within or a Fulminator Mage is very important for his hand. Architect cycled on the end step there for Eric. Stratexian Probe was the only play out of Andrew Jessup. Second land, and will be a pass. So, Andrew last game was able to win by going being fast. Hype about this, if, can Andrew go the opposite route and sit back and just really play a control game here? I, I think it's very, very hard. Uh -huh. I think Eric has enough ways to interact with him and enough ways to overpower him that the longer the game goes on for, it's in general gonna get worse for Andrew. Spell Pierce does allow him to play a slightly longer game. That card comes up, but even then, uh, that's only delaying the inevitable. 
And as you see, draw has become immense here from Andrew Jessup. Does have a copy of Ink Moth, so he has one Infector in his hand that he could go with. Layers in Star IQ. One, Dryad two, Arbor. Three. You have 50 minutes, and you may be in his hand. That one actually came out of the sideboard. And Ink Moth Nexus will be the play for the turn, and he'll just pass back. He it does seem to be digging in a little bit here. Cycle was Pale Recluse. And for Eric. And that's actually a land cycler, not a regular cycler. So go get a basic with it. It can say plain cycle or forest cycle. Not a big fan of the term land cycling because cycling implies get a random card, and land cycling is actually get a specific card. But yeah. still, just another... Is the term, though. Just, a, forest. Yeah. just another doof for this deck to go get. Uh, it's significant in this matchup because it has reach, so it's uh, some way to respond. Yeah, it actually can block an Ink Moth. Right. Deadshot Minotaur, though he deals damage to Flyers, actually does not have reach himself. He just... Yeah. Throws a yeah. rock at them. Exactly. Once. And he's out of rocks. It's the force he cycled for. And it's gonna looks like it will be that copy of Fulminator Mage for Eric Bloom. And this is really bad news for, for Andrew. And yeah, not even gonna wait, just go straight for Ink Moth Nexus. It could activate an Apostles Blessing itself. And who, yeah, it'll activate and get and Vines of Astro itself. Yep. So if Eric wanted to run that play, I think he would have been better served waiting for Andrew's upkeep because it would have at least consumed Andrew's entire turn. Agreed. Jataxian probe for Andrew. And now the man is down. If Andrew actually has enough pump, he can just go for a lethal swing here. He does have a become immense. With enough Jataxian probes, there's a chance here. Two copies of mutagenic growth. Yeah, and sorry, a land. Mutagenic growth. Gets yeah. him there. Yep. Violent Outburst, Violent Outburst, Demonic Dread, Demonic Dread, land for Eric. So, plenty there. You see Spell Pierce in Andrew's hand. He's actually set up pretty decently right now to punch some damage through. Yeah. And even if he can't kill Eric, there's probably some value to just activating Ink Moth and become immensing it and just putting seven on him, right? It may force Eric to fire off a living end just to get the Fulminator Age back. And that's a victory for Andrew as well. And also keep in mind, uh, Andrew's still with that Spell Pierce in hand, so he might be able to finagle it where he gets a lot of damage in. Forces Eric's hand to some extent on trying to fire off a living end that gets hit by Spell Pierce. It's very good if that happens. And they're down to 12 off a of fetch here. And yeah, it looks like he has a lot of these tools. Definitely one become immense in hand. And rather than getting damage, he's going to go for Blighted Agent right now leaving up Spell Pierce. It's possible that Eric, uh, excuse me, Andrew just wants to make it really juicy for Eric to fire off a living end this turn. There's a creature in play. There's a Fulminator Mage in Eric's graveyard. If that runs into a Spell Pierce, Andrew might be setting up a kill for next turn. Dryad Arbor the play for Eric. And he's going to go ahead and Demonic Dread. Yeah, and I think, I think Andrew set the trap here. So why the pre-combat Dryad Arbor? Uh, a reasonable question. It might be if Eric believes that Vines of Astrid can only hit your own creatures, which is like what the modern cards would do, then it makes sense that he would play this because he doesn't. Right. Well, no, it still cascades, actually, even if you counter the spell. Yeah. I'm not sure. Living End is cast either way. And Andrew at the ready with Spell Pierce. Yeah, this is just great sequencing here from Andrew because he just made it very, really attractive. Uh, it's almost impossible for Eric to turn down going for a living end this turn to get back his Fulminator Mage and get the Blighted Agent off the table. And now uh, it's very realistic for Andrew to just untap and kill Eric. Yeah, he has two damage unblockable right now with the Ink Moth and the Blighted Agent. He has six more from the Become Immense, so it really only will take a Mutagenic Growth or another Pump Spell to get it done he would need a land for some of the pump spells. Draw for the turn was Noble Hierarch. That's not going to add any damage right now.
Both of them looks at the cascade. He does have a Jataxian probe, so he can probe to try to find one of those pump spells for just for the win. And his life total is not under any duress here, so uh, I'm sure he's... Uh, I think he's very likely just to probe as the first order of business and see what's up. And that is going to be the play. Down to 10. Still sees outburst, outburst. Looks like three violent outbursts and one demonic dread. Yeah. Remember, those extra cards not hugely relevant. There are only three living ends in the deck. A draw was a second become a from Andrew. Uh, he's got a lot of cards in his graveyard. I don't know if he has that many cards in his graveyard. Well, you can definitely fire it off for one pretty easily. Yeah, and this, so he has he's got eight, and then the second become immense will be card nine. So the second one will cost him three. And he doesn't have to do it through the Nexus. He can just attack with Blighted Agent and use one the Nexus and for three. Yeah. So he actually can do both become immense. Yeah, here. he's got it all rolled up. And he knows it too. So first, Blighted Agent is going to become a 7-7. Seven, seven. It'll become immense, and then it will become even more immense. He actually has it yes, with room it to again. spare. He gets a noble hierarch for his trouble, too. <laughs> and there you have it. Andrew Jessup, two to one, takes out Eric Bloom, and he improves to 10 and two, dodging what seems to be a difficult matchup. I think that was just a really great play there from, from Jessup. The key point seemed to be that Fulminator Mage turn. I, I think that, was, that, that turn was really bad for Eric, and if he wanted to run that play, he could have waited until...